So I want to thank everyone for being here this evening. I'm going to talk to you tonight about the hidden information about the chemicals we use every day in our lives that's in the bottom of the lakes of Minnesota. So I'm going to start off by saying I am not anti-chemical. Right? I recognize chemistry makes modern life possible. Pharmaceuticals, agriculture, plastics, clothing, everything we do relies on chemistry. But we have to recognize if we don't design chemicals well and use them smartly and dispose of them properly, adverse impacts can happen in the environment. So we're surrounded by chemicals. In our house, we use cleaning agents, we use pharmaceuticals, uh, we have flame retardants in our furniture. That means they're around our bodies all the time. A lot of the chemicals we use, they go out into the environment. We put them on, out there on purpose, or they go down the drain. And when they're in the waters, they move around in the environment. They don't just stay in the water. They transport atmospherically. The chemicals we use here in Minnesota, we can find in the Arctic. And lastly, we have to recognize the chemicals we use are in our bodies. Right? Some of them we put there on purpose. We take medications, we put on lotions, but other chemicals come into our bodies from the environment, either from the water we drink or the food we eat. So how we look at chemicals is by looking at the sediments at the bottom of lakes. And the nice thing about sediments is they're deposited every year. That way, this gives us a way to look back in time at the chemicals that were present at different periods in history. So in the lake, there are particles. Some of them are biological, some of them are soil particles, but they're constantly raining down. And the chemicals in the lake stick to those particles. So every year, year new layers of particles are deposited, and it's possible using various techniques to date exactly when the particles were put down in the lake. So we can collect a sample of the bottom of the lake by using a sediment core. So basically we take a plastic tube, punch it down into the bottom of the lake. And we do that. At the top of the sediment core is the material that was deposited most recently. And at the bottom of the sediment core was material that was deposited long ago. And using these dating techniques, the top is recent, we can date back to about 1850, which gives us a nice long profile of human history. So I'm going to tell you three stories. I'm going to talk about three different classes of chemicals. One is triclosan, which is an antibacterial compound that was put in sort of all sorts of consumer products. The other, the next one is antibiotics, which you're probably all intimately familiar with. And the last is a group of disinfectants used for surfaces and as surfactants that are known as quaternary ammonium compounds, or QACs. So we've taken samples all over the state of Minnesota, from way up north to down here near the metro area. I'm going to focus on two of the lakes for most of the talk. One of them is Lake Pepin. Right, this is a widening of the Mississippi River downstream of the Twin Cities. The reason we like Lake Pepin is that it, its watershed integrates two-thirds of the state of Minnesota. Right? So we get a really integrated signal of the chemical pollution across the state. The other is Lake Winona which is not in Winona, it's in Alexandria. <laughs> and the reason we like Lake Winona is that at the southern tip of the lake, there's a wastewater treatment plant. And so we get a real good signal of what the humans are putting into the lake. And it's also got a very small watershed, just a few thousand feet wide. So really two end members of the groups of lakes in Minnesota. So this is triclosan and its chemical structure. Don't worry if it's bringing you chills of your organic chemistry experiences. This is just the language that chemists use to display what we're talking about. So this is a broad spectrum antimicrobial compound. It was in, put into a wide variety of products throughout the 70s and 80s when we decided we didn't like germs very much. What's really interesting about this chemical is that it really got put into products because of a marketing war between liquid hand soap companies so my product is better than your product. And it was never formally approved by the FDA for use, except for in anti-gingivitis toothpaste. It was first brought to market in uh, 1965, which is an important date as we go forward. So we started looking at triclosan in the lab, because the US Geological Survey had found it in a whole bunch of rivers around the, the state of Minnesota, or around the, sorry, around the country. 
And we wanted to know what might be happening to it in the environment. And we said, well, the first thing it's going to do is it's going to go through the wastewater treatment plant. The last step in wastewater treatment is disinfection with chlorine. And we looked at the wastewater effluent, and we found that there were three new compounds that we, where chlorines were added onto the triclosan ring. These are called chlorinated triclosan derivatives. So now we've got triclosan going to the environment and three new chemicals going into the environment that have not been tested for any sort of activity. We also found when these were exposed to sunlight, triclosan and these three chlorinated triclosan derivatives formed compounds known as dioxins. Dioxins are among the most toxic compounds known to humans. We've known about them for over 40 years. Now, there are 209 different dioxins. These four might not be the most toxic four, but now we're put, potentially putting these into the environment. So now we've got a total of seven new chemicals that are going to the environment from a compound that we use for marketing purposes. So at this point, we decided we needed to go and look out in the environment to see if we could actually find these chemicals. And you can bet that I've been talking to you about them this long because we did. So I'm going to show you a series of plots like this. The vertical axis is time. The sediment at the top is the most recent sediment. As you go down the slide, it's going back in time. And the horizontal axis is showing how much uh, is there, the concentration. So this is the plot for triclosan. Amazingly, before triclosan was invented, there was none of it in the sediment core. And once triclosan starts being used, we see it accumulating over time. We can see the chlorinated triclosan derivatives in the core that come from the disinfection of wastewater. And we can see the four dioxins that form from the photolysis of triclosan, or it's from its exposure to sunlight. And note the pattern of the dioxins looks a lot like that of triclosan which suggests that triclosan is the source of these materials. So I said there are 209 different dioxins. There are lots of sources of them. We know about them because in the 70s, we realized they were coming from incineration when we were burning garbage. And we realized that this was bad for the environment, and we changed how we do incineration so we don't make dioxins anymore. So since the 1970s, you can see these higher chlorinated dioxins with five, six, seven chlorines, eight chlorines on them have decreased dramatically over time. On the other hand, these lower chlorinated dioxins have increased over time. So over the past 40 years, we switched the source of dioxins in the environment from incineration to hand soap. So how do we deal with all these compounds being in the environment that shouldn't be there? Well, we presented this data to the Minnesota legislature, and they took action. So they passed a bill in 2014 that said as of January 1st, 2017, triclosan would be banned in all consumer products in Minnesota. And about that same time, the FDA finally decided they would do their review, and they basically told uh, all the manufacturers they would have to pull triclosan and 20 other chemicals from their products by the end of 2017. So I'm going to change gears now and go to antibiotics. Every year in the US, we use about 18,000 tons of antibiotics. Some of that goes to people, some of that goes to animals, and that's farm animals and that's pets. Doesn't matter where it's going, it's all going into the environment eventually. So I'm going to look at two different antibiotics. One is sulfapyridine. So the sulfa drugs were some of the first brought to market in the 1940s. And so not surprisingly, that's when we see them in the sediment cores. And here the orange, diamond, sorry, the orange squares are Duluth Harbor. The purple diamonds are Lake Pepin, and the bluish-green triangles are Lake Winona. So like, uh, we see a, a heavier signal in Lake Winona, which gets the direct wastewater impact, than in Lake Pepin, which is integrating the large watershed. If we look at a different drug, ofloxacin, it was invented in the 1980s. And so we don't see it in the sediment core until it, it's put into the market. So the sediment cores give us a way to look and say when chemicals are, are brought into the market. So we would think this would also tell us when chemicals are taken off the market. But here's when sulfapyridine came off the market. And it's still there. And so we have to start looking for other sources of this chemical. And the place we look is in our intestine. Not because it's being formed in our intestine, but we're taking another medication. This is sulfasalazine. And this is used as an arthritis medication. This part of the molecule is sulfapyridine. 
and the other part is essentially Tylenol. Right? So we've got a drug that's basically made up of an antibiotic and anti-inflammatory combined that when it goes through your gut, it gets uh, metabolized and the sulfapyridine is cleaved off and goes, into the goes through you and into the environment. So this might not be the smartest use of a chemical, right? We're putting an antibiotic out in the environment for treating pain. So what do we do about this? We need to start thinking about better chemical design. So this is a collaboration I'm uh, working on with Will Pomerantz in our Department of Chemistry here. We're looking at benign design of pharmaceuticals and pesticides, particularly looking at compounds that are fluorinated. So here we have a drug that could break down into two potential products in the environment, among many, but fluoride would essentially be non-toxic, and fluoroacetate would be very toxic. Will's interested in MRI reagents, particularly compounds like this here. The one on your left would certainly be persistent in the environment. That's kind of the current gold standard. The one we're trying to design is on the right. That should be bio or photodegradable. So we're working together to design these new chemicals and then test how they degrade to make sure they form non-toxic products versus potentially toxic products when they're in the environment. Lastly, I'm going to talk about quaternary ammonium compounds, things that you certainly have in your house right now. Right? These are used in, as surfactants and cleaning agents. They all have this kind of same similar chemical structure. We have this nitrogen with carbon chains and a positive charge. So I'm going to compare our two lakes again, Lake Pepin and Lake Winona. And these are benzalkonium chlorides. They're in Lysol disinfecting sprays, among other compounds. And we notice the patterns here are quite different. First of all, the, the levels in Lake Pepin are much higher than Lake Winona, which is reversive for every other chemical we've seen in our group. We think what we're seeing in Lake Winona is the signature of consumer use, right? This is a municipal wastewater treatment plant. In Lake Pepin, we're seeing a combination of what consumers are using as well as industrial use. And that's fortified by this large peak that we see in use that occurs in the 1970s. In the 1970s, the Clean and Water Act was passed. More effective wastewater treatment went into place, as well as industrial source control of pollution. So that, we think, leads to this large drop. And then the background signature we see after that is probably a combination of consumer use and residual industrial use. So we can see here that other legislation has had an effect on our water quality as well. So these compounds are interesting because they've been in use for a long time as disinfectants, well over 80 years at this point. So one of the impacts here is on the microbiome. So this is a map of genetic material called an integron that allows bacteria to exchange genetic material. Within this integron is a resistance gene to quaternary ammonium compounds, as well as to one to mercury. And these are two of the longest kind of used antibacterial compounds. So using these compounds has changed the environmental microbiome. This integron contains these two resistance genes, and they're transferred around throughout the environment, and not only throughout the environment, but these, this integron is in your intestines as well. So how can we improve treatment to present, prevent this kind of thing from happening in the future? So this is a collaboration with my colleague Ray Hazalski in, in civil and environmental engineering. We could use treatment wetlands, for example. Uh, the quaternary ammonium compounds and other compounds really like to stick to particles. If we could set out those particles before they reach the river, that would be a way to remove them. We could look at advanced filtration techniques for drinking water, or even adding ozonation onto our water or wastewater treatment plants to remove the chemicals so they don't get out into the environment. So lastly, I want to thank all the people who did this work. Uh, my students, Jill Kerrigan, Kale Anger, and Jeff Booth, as well as my postdoc, Sarah Patti, actually did all of these experiments and, and measurements. Uh, the triclosan work was a collaboration with Chris McNeil, who was in the Department of Chemistry here and is now at ETH Zurich. Dan Angstrom at the St. Croix Watershed Research Station and the Science Museum of Minnesota has helped us collect and date all these sediment cores, and all the analysis we did in the uh, Masonic Cancer Center here at the University of Minnesota. And with that, I thank you for your attention.